Hello everyone and welcome to this video. In this video, we are going to discuss the climate-related disclosures that have been proposed by certain regulators and certain standard setters and how they compare with each other. We are recording this video in March 2023. I am Katerina Vazaki. I am a Senior Manager in EY Global Corporate Reporting Services at EY GSLLP based in London and I am part of the Sustainability Reporting Team. I'm joined today by my colleague Christian North, who is a partner in Climate Change and Sustainability Services at Ernst & Young uh, GmbH based in Stuttgart, and he is also the Global Sustainability Reporting and Assurance Solution Leader. Welcome, Christian. Thank you. My colleague Jason Bond is also joining us today, who is a partner in America's professional practice at Ernst & Young LLP based in New York City. Welcome, Jason. Great to be here. So we are well aware that uh, there are many entities out there that already provide disclosures about environmental, social and governance matters, the ESG matters. But uh, this is mainly done on a voluntary basis. So um, stakeholders such as investors are quite keen to receive information about these matters uh, in a more consistent and more comparable way uh, so as to make their uh, investment decisions. Uh, so in response to these needs, uh, certain regulators and certain standard setters have taken action and proposed uh, rules and uh, uh, issued draft standards to require entities to make uh, various climate-related uh, disclosures. So in this video, we are going to focus on the proposals that have been issued by um, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, the International Sustainability Standards Board, the ISSB, and the first set of draft standards uh, issued by the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, the IFRAG. So probably good to note here that um, one of the main similarities of these three frameworks is the fact that uh, they are based more or less on the recommendations of the uh, Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD. But uh, let's now compare the requirements and point out some of their key differences. So I'll kick off our discussion today by setting the scene of the current status of these uh, three uh, frameworks. And starting with the ISSB, I would like to point out that uh, the proposals in the exposure drafts in the first two standards, uh, the IFRSS1 that covers the general requirements uh, on sustainability related financial information, and the IFRSS2 that covers the uh, climate related disclosures, uh, received a broad support. However, specific topics were deliberated by the ISSB uh, based on the comments received by respondents. Um, so the ISSB has now completed its deliberations and aims to finalize these standards in June 2023. Uh, and these final standards uh, upon their issuance will need to be adopted by the authorities in uh, the um, uh, local jurisdictions before they become mandatory in those jurisdictions. Uh, Jason, can you briefly tell us about the status, the current status of the SEC proposals? I'd be happy to, Katarina. So I should first start out by noting that the SEC received thousands of, of comment letters on their climate-related disclosure proposal. And so they're going through all the, those comments, but generally the, the comments supported the proposal's objectives, but noted that certain changes would be needed as, as part of the final rules. And so they're, they're currently making updates and we currently expect that a, a final rule will be issued in the, in the first half of, of 2023. Right, um, thanks Jason. And uh, Christian, can you discuss about the current status of the IFRAG proposals? Happy to do so, Katrina. And uh, just on the current status, let me start with the European Parliament and the Council of the European Union. They both gave the final approval in November 2022, so last year, for a Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, also known as CSRD. The CSRD includes a mandate to report under sustainability information under a reporting framework established, as you have mentioned earlier, Katarina, by EFREC, that is the technical advisor to the European Commission. 
So EFREC has now submitted the first set of draft European sustainability reporting standards, the so-called ESRSs, to the European Commission on the 22nd of November last year, so 2022. And the European Commission is now uh, in a position that can make changes to this first set of draft standards, uh, but must adopt them by a delegated act no later than June 30th, 2023. So upcoming, at which point they will become and be determined to be final. However, compliance with these final standards will be mandatory after the CSRD is transposed, that is included into local law of each and every European Union member state, which is required by July 2024. So throughout the 27 member states, we can see that the adoption of the CSRD might deviate time-wise. But that is the current roadmap where we are. Right. Great. Thanks for that, uh, Christian. So um, let's get started with um, looking at the main differences we identified uh, among these proposals. And I'll start with the scope. So with respect to the ISSB proposals, um, whether entities should apply those standards uh, is something that uh, would be at the discretion of the regulators of each jurisdiction. Also good to note here that um, the ISSB has a broad remit. That means that uh, its intention is to deliver um, a comprehensive set of sustainability-related disclosure standards uh, covering a wide spectrum of sustainability-related topics. And as I said, so far, the ISSB has proposed two standards to cover the general disclosure requirements that apply uh, to, to all sustainability-related topics, as well as uh, disclosures uh, that, are, uh, that, that, that specifically apply to the climate topic. Now, specific disclosure requirements for the other sustainability-related uh, topics, um, other than the general uh, disclosures required by the IFRSS1, uh, will be developed uh, based on the priorities that the ISSB will set in its agenda consultation. Um, but what about the uh, scope of the SEC uh, proposal, Jason? Well, Katarina, the, the scope of the SEC proposal is that it would apply to all SEC registrants. So that would include foreign registrants and as well as emerging growth companies. It would even apply to companies entering the, the US capital markets for the first time. And, and that's either being done through an initial public offering or by being acquired by a, 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 public, off, a public company. Now, the proposal here focuses only on climate related disclosures as opposed to the broader ESG but companies should be aware that the SEC does have on its agenda additional human capital disclosures and uh, board diversity disclosures. Right. Thanks, Jason. So, uh, Christian, I think the scope of the EFRA draft standards is, is broader, isn't it? Yes, that is correct, Katarina. And uh, maybe I can start off with a quick comment. Talking about scope, it, it's twofold. Uh, you asked me for the scope of EFRA draft standards. So the, e, uh, the draft ESRSs requires disclosures of climate-related and other ESG matters. So that's content-wise, including other environmental matters, such as biodiversity, just to give you one example, mm -hmm. on social matters like own workforces, and on governance matters, especially with the business conduct. So that's on the topics which need to be disclosed. But Jason also mentioned scoping in, a, in the terms of who is in scope. That is something which will be covered by a CSRD. So when the ESRS, when finalized, will apply to the following entities as outlined by CSRD, all companies listed on EU regulated markets will be in scope, except for micro companies and small and medium sized listed entities that might opt out and or apply uh, simpler standards that are currently being developed by EFREC. Then we have large undertakings, large companies, uh, that is an EU company which is subject to uh, reporting, and we have insurance undertaking and credit institutions, regardless of their legal form. So these three groups are in scope of CSRD and therefore subject to ESRS disclosure requirements. Right, that, that's helpful to know. Thanks, Christian. Um, and I'll move on with the key differences and discuss the materiality topic now. So 
Um, I know that the proposals in these three frameworks uh, define materiality differently. And that means that we should also expect uh, a different application of materiality. And again, starting with, uh, with the ISSB, um, the definition of uh, materiality uh, that the ISSB gave uh, aligns with the definition of materiality uh, in the IFRS accounting standards. Um, this essentially means that uh, the, the, the focus of this definition is on the information needs uh, of the primary users of general purpose financial reports, uh, for example, the uh, information needs of uh, investors or creditors. Now, with respect to the application of materiality when it comes to sustainability-related financial information, uh, materiality is meant to be applied when identifying uh, information for all disclosure requirements that have been included in, in the proposed standards. Uh, this essentially means that uh, if a disclosure is considered uh, as not material, then the entity will not need to disclose this information. Uh, but Jason, I think the SEC proposal uses a, a similar threshold, isn't it? It, it does. So the, the SEC proposal would primarily apply a disclosure threshold based on its definition of, of materiality although that, that threshold isn't applied consistently throughout the, the proposal. Now, that definition is based on U.S. Supreme Court precedent and states that a matter is material if there is a substantial likelihood that a reasonable investor would consider it important when determining whether to buy or sell securities or, or how to vote. Now, that definition focuses on the, the users of the information, which is, is similar to the ISSB's definition. I should point out, though, that there are more specific thresholds in the proposal for disclosures relating to, to financial impacts and expenditures of, of severe weather events, other natural conditions, and transition activities. Also, the, the disclosures about a company's climate-related governance and risk management, as well as climate-related targets and goals and scenario analysis, and even scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emissions, or would be required regardless of, of materiality. Right, thanks, Jason. And uh, Christian, it, it's interesting that the draft ESRS used the concept of uh, double materiality. Um, can you please elaborate a bit on this? Yeah, sure. So the concept of double materiality means the disclosure is material if it is material from what is called an impact perspective. That's the inside out perspective. And or a financial perspective, which is the outside-in perspective, the impact on the financials, or a combination of both. So not the sum of, that's important, that's sometimes misunderstood, it's either or. Mm -hmm. So a sustainability matter is material from an impact perspective if it pertains to the entity's material, actual, or potential positive or negative impacts on people or the environment, so inside out. A sustainability matter is material from a financial perspective if it triggers or may trigger material financial effects on the entity outside in, including its impact on cash flows, the development, performance position, and costs of capital or access to finance. So unlike the materiality de definitions used in the SEC or by the ISSB proposals, the materiality definition in the draft ESRS considers both affected stakeholders, that is employees, customers, vendors, the community, and second, other users of the sustainability reporting information, such as investors or creditors. However, materiality does not apply to certain standards within the draft ESRSs. That is, we have a mandatory reporting, for example, on climate matters and on workforce matters. And on addition, in addition to that, we also have certain uh, disclosures required and related data points to be presented in the, uh, required by the draft ESRSs that are required by other EU law and are also then required to be reported. Right, thanks Christian. Um, so I'll move on with uh, the differences that relate to scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emissions, the so-called GHG emissions. And uh, starting again with the ISSB, so as, as part of its uh, deliberations, uh, the ISSB decided to require an entity to use the GHG protocol 
uh, to calculate its GHG emissions. Also, um, it decided to require an entity to exclude from these calculations the impact of uh, purchased or generated offsets and disclose them separately. And also another requirement was to ask entities to uh, report its scope to GHG emissions using a allocation-based method and also um, provide relevant information about uh, contractual instruments um, related to um, managing energy that the entity has purchased. Um, but uh, Jason, what about the SEC proposals on the disclosure topic of uh, scope one and scope two GHG emissions? Well, well, first of all, as, as you mentioned, the ISSB proposal requires the use of the greenhouse gas protocol, whereas the, the SEC proposal would not require registrants to uh, use the greenhouse gas protocol. Registrants could use the protocol, but the, the SEC proposal would allow them to use other methodologies or frameworks as, as long as those methodologies comply with the general requirements of, of the proposal. And then the SEC proposal would require disclosure of, of both scope one and scope two emissions. And that would be done for each of the seven greenhouse gases for each scope. So that's a little bit more disaggregated than, than the other two, either proposals or, or draft standards. And so that's really a, a key difference here. Mm -hmm. Now the impact of, of purchased or generated offsets would be excluded from these calculations and would be separately disclosed. Now, in terms of what method scope two greenhouse gas emissions would be uh, disclosed under, the SEC proposal would allow companies to either use a location-based method, a market-based method, both methods separately, or, or a combination, or even another method, as long as it's identified and, and disclosed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks, Jason. And um, Christian, what about the IFRA proposals on scope one and scope two GHG emissions? Katrina, I think there are three things I would like to highlight. First, the draft ESRS includes specific guidance for the calculation and calculating GHG emissions, but also requires an entity to consider the principles, requirements, and the guidance provided by the GHG protocol and the global reporting initiative, GRI, especially the GRI standard 305. So GRI 305 is directly based on the requirements of the GHG protocol when preparing information for reporting GHG emissions. So it allows an entity to also consider requirements in International Organization for Standardization, so the ISO, especially the 14064, released 2018. So that's number one. Number two, the draft ESRSs also requires an entity to calculate scope one and scope two emissions with the impact of purchased or generated uh, offsets that are excluded and need to be reported and disclosed separately. And third, the draft ESRS requires additional disclosures, including the percentage of scope one GHG emissions under regulated emission trading schemes and scope two emissions using both location and market-based methods. So that's, those are the three things I would like to highlight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good to know. Thanks, Christian. So I'll uh, continue with the GHG emission topic, and uh, I want us to also discuss about the key differences relating to um, the disclosure requirements on scope three GHG emissions. And uh, on this, the, the ISSB uh, decided to require entities to disclose scope three GHG emissions as well. Um, but uh, the entities will be provided with a temporary exemption uh, from, from disclosing scope 3 GHG emissions uh, for, for one year after the application of the um, ISSB standards. Um, also, uh, while measuring the scope 3 GHG emissions, uh, an entity will be able to apply the concept of using uh, only reasonable and um, uh, supportable information that is available at the reporting date without uh, undue cost or effort. And um, also another requirement was that um, an entity will need to uh, disclose the categories of uh, upstream or downstream activities that um, are included um, in its uh, calculation of uh, scope 3 GHG emissions. Uh, Jason, do you see any major differences in the requirements uh, of, of the SEC on scope three GHG emissions? 
Yeah, Katarina, there's there's a couple differences I want to point out here. First, the, the SEC proposal around scope three greenhouse gas emissions is, is conditional. And so the proposal would require an entity to disclose scope three greenhouse gas emissions if they're material or if the entity has set an emissions target that includes scope three greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. Now, a registrant would also have to disclose that the categories of upstream or, or downstream activities that are included in the calculation and disclose scope three greenhouse gas emissions data separately for any category that's significant to the registrant. Now, the proposal here would also provide a safe harbor that would limit a registrant's liability for any inaccurate disclosures of, of scope three greenhouse gas emissions, unless those disclosures were made without a reasonable basis or in other than, than good faith. Right, I see. Um, thanks, Jason. And Christian, is there anything uh, different you have identified in the FRAG requirements about the uh, scope three GG emissions? Yes, uh, the draft ESRSS requires entity to, entities to disclose uh, scope 3 GHG emissions for each significant scope 3 category. Right. So okay. That's, that's it. Sure. Thank you, Christian. So um, I'll move on with the key differences and discuss the disclosure requirements about scenario analysis. So the ISSB discussed this issue and uh, decided to require entities uh, to use a climate-related scenario analysis. So such uh, scenario analysis uh, should be commensurate to, uh, to the entity's circumstances in order to assess the resilience of its business strategy. Um, and again, in order to develop this uh, scenario analysis, the entity will be able to apply the concept of using uh, only uh, reasonable and supportable information that is available at the reporting date without um, um, undue cost or effort. And uh, also uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative information will need to be disclosed um, about the, the results of this scenario analysis and uh, about uh, how this has been conducted. Um, what about the SEC proposal, Jason? Well, different than, than what you described, the SEC proposal would not require an, a registrant to use a scenario analysis to assess its resilient to, resilience to climate-related risk. However, I should point out that if a registrant does use a scenario analysis or other analytical tools, then it would be required to disclose quantitative and qualitative information about that analysis. So there, there is a difference there. Right. I see. So um, I think, Christian, the IFRA pro pro proposal uh, requires a scenario analysis, isn't it? Correct, Katarina. The draft ESRS is requiring an entity to use a climate-related scenario analysis with at least one scenario in line with the Paris Agreement to assess the resilience of its business strategy. Also required are quantitative and qualitative information about the results of the analysis how it was conducted and how it was used to inform the identification and the assessment of climate-related risks. Right, so um, let me finish off this good conversation we have today with the proposed effective date of each framework. And uh, I know that in its deliberations, the ISSB decided as uh, effective date the 1st of January, 2024 and also uh, decided to allow for early adoption. Uh, however, the actual application date will depend on uh, when uh, each jurisdiction will decide to adopt the, the ISSB standards uh, after these, uh, these are issued. Um, Jason, any updates on the effective date for the SEC proposal? Yeah, Katarina, with, with respect to the effective date, the, the co compliance dates for the SEC proposal would be based on the registrant's filing status, but we really don't know what that will be at this point. Now, the SEC received a, a significant number of comments encouraging it to defer the proposed com compliance dates that were included in the proposal, uh, but those compliance dates that were included in the proposal assumed that the rules would be adopted by the, the end of 2022, but that didn't happen. So we'll see as, as the final rules are, are issued. Christian, what about the, the CSRD effective dates? 
Yeah, so the CSRD effective dates and uh, the application of ESRS is once finalized. Uh, the effective dates actually depend on the entity's size. So just to give you an example, and we have three dates which are irrelevant. So for example, entities subject to the non-financial reporting directive, NFRD, large listed entities, the effective date will be the first fiscal year 2024 to be reported in 25. While uh, it will be fiscal year 25 for large entities not subject to the non financial reporting directive. And then, third, for listed small, medium sized entities, it will be the fiscal year 2026 to be reported in 2027. And last but not least, we also have some rules around third country company reporting, which kicks in 1 1 28, so fiscal year 2028. Those are the, the dates which we have. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, thank you. Thank you both very much. So, so ultimately, entities should consider evaluating these proposals in more detail, um, so as to determine how they will be affected, and especially if they have significant operations in, in various jurisdictions, because that means that uh, more than one set of requirements will be applicable to them. Um, for more details on the key differences among these frameworks, um, you can always refer to our uh, publication technical line, how the climate-related disclosure proposals from the SEC, EFRAC and ISSB compare, which you can access by visiting ey.com forward slash accounting link. And this brings us to uh, to the end of our today's video, where we have covered um, uh, some highlights uh, of the key differences among the requirements on climate-related disclosures proposed by um, the ISSB, the SEC, and uh, EFRAC. Of course, entities should keep monitoring the developments uh, since the final rules and standards may differ from these proposals. And with that, Christian, Jason, and I would like to thank you very much for listening in and we hope you have a great day.